All right, everybody, thank you so much for joining us. Um, my name is Peggy Hicks. I'm the Director of Thematic Engagement, Special Procedures, and Right to Development at the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, often referred to as the longest title in the room. If anybody can compete with that, let me know afterwards. Um, we're very glad that with uh, all the many um, items on the packed agenda here at the IGF that you've taken the time to come talk with us, really, about a project of the UN's Human Rights Office uh, that really grows out of uh, many of the types of conversations that I've heard in, in the rooms here uh, about how we really move from a level of, of discussion that's quite general about what it means to bring human rights to new technologies and start really applying it in practice. And in particular, looking at the UN guiding principles on business and human rights and thinking about what do they mean? What can we expect from companies? And I was just in an earlier session for those of you that were there, apologies for repeating. But you know, one of the big things that we hear is that we know as a, the private sector, as companies, that the UN guiding principles on business and human rights are, are, are cornerstone, they're, you know, we're committed to, to implementing and respecting rights in, in accordance with the guiding principles, but they pose challenges for companies that are trying to apply them with regards to, you know, new technologies like, for example, facial recognition. Um, it's not as, as straightforward. We don't have prior examples or case studies that can be used in terms of how we do this the same way we might in the apparel industry or the extractive industry where there's been a lot of work already done on how the guiding principles uh, can be used in that space. So the, the BTEC project grows out of uh, that idea that we needed to really get more practical and start developing guidance on some of the key questions that private sector companies are facing in trying to fulfill their responsibilities under the UN guiding principles on business and human rights. So I'm going to do a, a brief introduction of, of the project and then I'm gonna turn over to Mark Hodge who we're incredibly fortunate to have working with us on this project and who is sort of the the brains along with uh, Lene Wendland uh, behind the, the BHR aspects of, of what we're trying to do. Um, so for those of you who haven't had a chance to look at uh, the materials on this, we have uh, created a web page portal on our website, ohchr.org, that uh, contains the background on the BTEC project. We ha introduced uh, in June of, of this year a scoping paper about what we tr wanted to accomplish through the project and solicited comments and input on that paper over the course of the last few months. And now the, the final version of that scoping paper is online at the portal. Um, and we really wanted to thank those who came in with uh, comments and support on that effort. Uh, we had all sorts of engagement, both from state representatives, from civil society organizations, and, and many others. Um, and we also have a, a blog post on there that talks about the key trends and the takeaways from the public consultation process that we had around that scoping paper. So while that paper was being finalized, we've done a couple of things. We've, we've had a number of informal consultations with companies, civil society organizations, with GNI, a key stakeholder in this for us, with experts and with some states to talk about the project. And we've also done uh, two outreach events, uh, multi-stakeholder, one in South Africa and one in Seoul, South Korea, trying to make sure that we see this as a project that is really global um, in the way that we're looking at it. It's, it's not just focused on Silicon Valley and, and companies in the West. Um, we also at the Business and Human Rights Forum, which is unfortunately taking place simultaneously with, uh, with IGF, so, uh, so people like Mark uh, are shuttling back and forth. Um, but we had a, a session on that uh, relating uh, to the project at the Business and Human Rights Forum in Geneva yesterday as well, looking specifically at remedy issues and how we might be able to address remedy issues in the context of uh, this project too. 
So the next step for us is that we're working on some foundational papers that are going to restate the core concepts uh, related uh, on the guiding principles that relate to tech companies, and they'll sort of form the basis for the, for the practical work that's being done. And then we move into the, the phase that we're all very much looking forward to, which is really working on case-based scenarios derived from the companies and participants within this, where we're going to work through in a collaborative way how we answer some of the critical questions that are being faced um, in applying the guiding principles in the, the tech sector. Um, I have other speaking points here that I could go into, but I think it's better to turn over to Mark. Um, we think there's a lot of reasons why it's important for both companies and governments to support this effort. Um, we're very excited about the fact that it's, it's not simply bilateral. We're working across um, companies so that we come up with um, ways of approaching these issues that will be shared rather than company by company defining these things uh, for themselves with, with not necessarily the full level of input. Uh, and we think it can really be helpful to provide a safe space for companies to work through the challenges that they face. We found that a lot within our business and human rights project in general, that that peer learning, you know, we can be at the table as a resource, but often it's the peer learning uh, amongst the companies that, that is the most fruitful in discussing some of these issues, and we're hoping to provide a good space for that to happen. Um, so with that uh, a initial introduction to the project, uh, Mark, I'll turn over to you uh, to speak a little bit more about the substance here. Thank you, Peggy, um, and good afternoon. I think it just turned afternoon, right? So, um, gosh, this is a big room. It's weird when you can hear yourself echo back to yourself. But um, really pleased to have you all here. Thank you for taking time to, to be with us. As Peggy mentioned, my name is Mark Hodge, and I've spent the last best part of 15 years working in business and human rights, um, more recently in the last 10 years or so, focusing on uh, the original kind of UN Protect, Respect, Remedy framework and now the implementation of the guiding principles in a range of sectors, uh, I have become very interested and very moved by the idea that we can, I think, apply the guiding principles in the context of the technology sector and some of the challenges we're facing. Um, I see while there are, it's a new area and we don't have good uh, enough kind of examples and experiences, I see vast lessons that can be learned from what other sectors have gone through. So I come to this with that premise and hope <laughs> and, thing, and an idea to explore. They also come to this with you know, certainly a, a very limited or new level of understanding around the technology sector compared to all of you in the room. So um, that's part of the value of having these consultations as well. Um, just to, to, to reiterate what Peggy said, just to put a point on it a little bit, we are at a very key moment in the project in terms of moving from conceptual framing ideas of where we want to focus into formalizing research partnerships, setting up consultations next year, being clear on what our deliverables will be next year as well. So I will make sure, will make sure that we have time towards the end of this uh, time we have together to, uh, to, to share that with you and to talk about what the, what the concrete plans are next year. But I wanted to split kind of our time up here into really two parts. One very quick part to just provide a bit more sort of substantive context to the project and the logic behind it. Uh, and how we're approaching it, sort of the, the process and substance at a sort of general level. And then uh, I think most of our time is most fruitfully spent on diving into what we call the focus areas of the project. There are four focus areas. Uh, and as we get to that point, I'm going to need some help from you in the room to understand how much you've already engaged with the substance and the materials we've sent out, because that'll help me figure out um, how to manage our time together, because want, we want to make sure that we allow time for you to input into this. So in terms of then the first, just in terms of the context of the project and building on what Peggy has said, as Peggy has mentioned uh, and I've mentioned, we are very clearly focused on how can we apply and leverage the ideas, the spirit, the approaches embedded in the UN Guiding Principles on Human Rights in relation to a whole range of challenges around new technologies. Um, and I will say that we are very 
acutely aware that what we need to do is also be honest where there are limits of where the guiding principles take us, right? The guiding principles are not the mechanism through which we can galvanize states to fully meet all of their state obligations, and that's a critical aspect, right, of what happens in this field. Um, there are also parts of other international human rights law that are connected to and are referenced in the guiding principles, so form the normative basis, um, but are sort of mentioned in passing, and so we do want to touch on those, and one good example is international humanitarian law in conflict situations and what that might say about technology companies. But the guiding principles are definitely our starting point. Consistent with that, we are very much focused on the three pillars of the guiding principles. We believe that it has always been, lessons over the years have shown us that it can be problematic if you focus too much on the second pillar of the UN guiding principles without reference to the role of the state and what the state can do and indeed access to remedy. So you'll hear in the focus areas that we have set out, we touch on all of those areas as well because that's critically important. I suppose to, I was thinking this morning, how could I articulate kind of our theory of change for this project, right? And I think it's fairly simple in that we believe there is value in clarifying the normative expectation of the guiding principles and related norms, but to do that through pointing to practice, to do that through pointing to this is a good example of human rights due diligence around end use. This is a good example of where a company has leaned into remedy or indeed where the state or civil society have enabled remedy. Because unless we get to that sort of slightly more granular level of what this looks like, we start talking about you know, scaling and incentives and other levers we could use with no real sense of what good practice looks like. So I think our first approach is how do we clarify and get very detailed around uh, what, what is there in practice. And even where practice doesn't exist, I think to hypothesize and say this is what good should look like in this context, right? Um, and this is the journey we should be on. So that's the kind of first, developing leading practice, pointing to leading practice. And the second piece is to make certainly recommendations around how the wider system around business um, sets up incentives, tries to drive scale around this, sets up requirements, right, around what is expected of companies, how that can get embedded in various, both regulatory but also non-regulatory approaches, and the role of investors we've had lots of conversations about as well in this space. So um, with that, I think it is, I, I, I'm going to, um, in the spirit of just kind of opening up, pause and see if anyone has any sort of foundational questions here at this point around what we're trying to do before I start to talk about our focus areas and more of the substance. And thank you, and please introduce yourself. Uh, Oh, my name is Emmanuel Sam. I'm from Sierra Leone. Uh, I'm very much interested in the uh, issue of business and human rights because of my background. And um, I know it's a new frontier. It's very difficult sometimes for these guiding principles that we have proposed uh, by John Ruggie. Uh, they, they are difficult to apply to certain uh, situations, especially in developing countries uh, like Africa, when you go to countries like Africa, you know, countries in Africa, um, they, are they are difficult to apply because, you know, we have these multinational corporations, which I believe are more, you know, rich and they use these high technologies they take them to these indigenous people, especially in the mining sector. The mine there, and a lot of human rights violations occur during those, you know, their activities in those areas. So, I am, I, my question is, how can technology uh, influence the guiding principles, especially AI, artificial technology. Is artificial technology more better than the current technology that we are using in, in, the, in order to help uh, curb some of these serious human rights violations that these uh, multinational corporations are causing? Thank you very much. And we'll take a few more comments or questions. And again, um, please try and be brief so that we can make sure we get onto the substance. Um, Liam, please introduce yourself. Um, hello, my name is Marita Wigertaler from Oxfam in Germany. 
Um, we are working a lot on human rights due diligence, especially in Germany with regard to the new law that hopefully is coming up and a new campaign being there to push for the enforcement on a legislative way. Um, my question is a bit in terms of, uh, did you do a kind of scoping um, how digital technologies so far are used for the better or the worse? Um, I came about one example from my colleagues working on uh, the World Food Programme, and they are very concerned that there are no safeguards in place, uh, how the data are used uh, and how people's data are protected. Uh, or there was a special a report from the Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty highlighting that social protection systems uh, and uh, using digital technologies in social protection systems is used for, let's say, uh, fo uh, focusing on fraud and cost savings and not for making social protection systems better. So um, that's the one bit. And the second question is, I think you are saying you're focusing on the digital sector, but I think there are no board, I mean, there is not just the digital sector, because even the tech companies are involved in many sectors. We know that Google is into health, into traffic, um, so I think it's not worthwhile just to focus on one sector, but to look at what are the implications at the cross-sectoral um, level. Mm, thank you. Thank you. That's really, these are really helpful questions of scope, actually, so I'm glad we paused to ask these. Anyone from this side of the room? And you don't, you don't have to be forced to speak. But. <laughs> Okay. Oh. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, my name is uh, Frank Kamunga. I'm a human, human rights lawyer from the uh, Democratic Republic of Congo. Uh, I only have one comment and two very short questions. Uh, the first one is on the, uh, the benchmark that actually um, pushed the Human Rights Office to decide to bring the BTEC project. You, have, you didn't really elaborate on that. On, why did you decide to bring in this VTEC project? What was the state of progress or what has pushed to that? Uh, the two second, I mean, two small questions are, one is related to uh, the gender perspective within the project. Um, I'm very much interested to see what is your approach in bringing the gender dimension within the project framework. And the very last one is related to protection of human rights defenders working in business sector. I think that the most fragile, uh, whatever revelations and information provided related to fraud and uh, in business sector, uh, corruption, they are the most targeted people. And whatever they work on reports, like that, they get more fragile. So is the project taking care of that kind of dimension in terms of protection for human rights defenders working on new business and human rights? So I think these are my questions. Thank you. Should I offer a few? Oh, one more comment or question. Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for this discussion. That's pretty amazing. I'm Edson Press. I'm from Brazil. I'm a member of a high-level panel of digital cooperation. And I was wondering if you are considering the international monetary law in the discussion. Because uh, uh, we have uh, some principles that are very important, mainly if you are considering life and the machines, and not only little Apple machines. Currently, you see a lot of uh, AI being used in the medical domain. So probably in the near future, you can have uh, a diminish of a human agents because of the output produced by these machines. So it's necessary to consider principles like distinction, proportionality, uh, of course, accountability that already appears in human rights declaration and others. Thank you so much. Sorry, I didn't quite hear you said, are we considering international humanitarian, humanitarian law? OK, great. Yeah. I, I can, um, should I offer some quick thoughts? Or, yes. Yeah? OK, so I'll be brief, and then I'll let Peggy weigh in, and then we'll talk about some of our focus areas. So first of all, this question around the use of technology to address kind of wider business and human rights realities that we face. It's critically important. I think within this project, we have to be very careful about scope of what we're doing, right? Um, and I, you know, I think the platform of this project, there'll be opportunities to point to other work or key issues. But currently, that we haven't included that within the direct scope of this project. That's not to say that AI, human rights, and technology won't help us deal with a whole range of 
due diligence questions and human rights questions and empowerment questions and power questions within the context of business and human rights. But that's sort of an initial just honest response that that hasn't currently been where we've been focusing our energy. Um, that's not to say we shouldn't go there and it's something we'll reflect on obviously as we move forward, but it's not been where we've anchored the work so far at this point in time. Um, on terms of scoping, we have we done a scoping? We have done ex some level of our own research, but also frankly engaged with a whole range of organizations that have been working for many years on where the issues are, whether it's in relation to cloud computing, AI algorithms, whether it's being used in the context you know, facial recognition, as Peggy mentioned, um, the whole kind of internet of things dynamic with connected devices. So we have got a good sense, I think, of the breadth of issues that are out there. Um, I wouldn't say a perfect sense, and it's changing every day, as we know, um, but I do think we have that and large, larger community around us to help us kind of grapple with those questions. Um, on the question of um, non-tech companies, it's a question that we've had asked to us before in this project. We are not saying that, so I think you're right that there are certain technology companies that engage and provide service and product for different industries and we will pay very acute attention to that as we get into the details of the project. So for example, in focus area two, when we talk about end use, end use happens in a context, right? End use doesn't happen independent of say a financial, in a financial setting or in healthcare, for example, or indeed in the employment human resources space. So very alert to those dynamics including obviously the role of the state as well and the way that the states use these technologies increasingly. So very alert to that, that we want to make sure we anchor into what are the primary duties and responsibilities of those actors that are kind of developing, designing and deploying the technology, right? So there'll be a bit of a bloodline as we go through the project, but that's where we're starting. Um, I'm gonna leave, I'll say one word about sort of the gender aspect and then I'll say one word about um, international humanitarian law. Um, so very quickly, um, this, just actually this morning I was having a conversation and one of the big challenges in human rights due diligence in this space is actually engaging affected stakeholders. And I think their agenda aspect, as well as other stakeholders, will be critically important. Um, I, will, I haven't thought much yet about the human rights defenders piece, I'll let Peggy weigh in on that, I think it's a, it's a really good question to us. International humanitarian law. We have not referenced conflict to international humanitarian law in our focus areas. We have though now managed to We've just set up a research, a small piece of research to look cr on a cross-cutting basis around how you look at um, these questions of technology in the context of international humanitarian law because they clearly provide existing clear duties, right, <laughs> and obligations to non-state actors as well. Um, and so we are definitely doing some sort of ex and laying out the normative framework around that and we'll also comment on where are the issues that we're seeing, where is technology in gate impeding on or getting close to the kind of violations of humanitarian law. So it's not in the focus paper, but it's going to be cross-cutting and we, we've started, well, we'll start in January, a piece of research on that. And, and just uh, uh, coming on to the questions that Frank asked, uh, in terms of why we, we came to this, um, I think it does go to some of the conversation that we've already had. I mean, we, we have a business and human rights project already, um, and we have a new human rights and new technologies project and coming out of both of those areas there was a strong push for this is one of the gaps that the office is best suited to fill. I mean how we define what we do isn't always you know we look for the urgent areas but unfortunately there are many many urgent areas so it often comes down to you know where does the skill set and ability of our office best fit the most urgent needs and where do we have the added value and we thought it would work here. Um, I really was happy to hear your point about the impact of, on human rights defenders and uh, the vulnerability, particularly of those that are working on uh, business and um, corruption, land rights, environment, you know, those areas. Um, we do have a specific focus on threats to human rights defenders and, uh, and, our folk, and really trying to hone in on uh, those vulnerable groups as well and looking specifically at how the online environment has changed the way um, the human rights defenders both work and are threatened, and what can the office bring in that. And that's a particular cross-cutting piece of work that we're going to expand on and work on in the coming year. So it won't be directly within the BTEC project, but it's certainly a, a you know important focus for the office. 
Thank you. And that'll certainly come up when we get into questions of remedy as well and accountability in the project is the role of defenders and civil society in being part of the ecosystem of accountability and remedy. Okay, so we have just over half an hour left in the session. Um, what I'm going to propose, which uh, is that I do a very quick overview of the four focus areas instead of doing it one by one and then pausing because we'll time out. So I will do a, um, a, a speedy overview <laughs> of the focus areas and then pause and we'll just allow the conversation to go where, it, where, where you guys want to take it in terms of questions and inputs. Um, what I will say is that part of the objective for us today in hosting this is partly to provide an update and some openness around what we're doing in the project, but also to allow individuals to sort of recognize where in the project they might be able to engage with us, might particular focus areas, particular questions we're asking, where you're already working, or where you'd like to kind of engage further with us. So please bear that in mind as you hear me kind of go through the, 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 the focus areas. How many people in the room have seen the scoping paper? that is online. Um, <laughs> seen and read, how about that? <laughs> okay. okay, that's very helpful because um, what I didn't want to do is sort of repeat to you everything you've read before, so I will, I'll, I'll take some time on each of them. So we have four focus areas in the project. The first one is focused on addressing human rights risks and related to business models. The second focus area is focusing on human rights due diligence and end use of technology, products, and services. The third focus area is on accountability and remedy, so exploring how the questions of um, remedy at a company level, but in particular kind of a wider ecosystem of remedy, really play out in the context of some of the realities of new technologies. And our fourth area, which is very cross-cutting, is looking at how the role of states and looking at sort of what we call the smart mix of measures that states could be deploy and should deploy when steering um, kind of our whole governance rate right, around these technologies and these approaches and these systems. Um, and so in that fourth area, we'll look at things like public procurement, regulation, um, trade, trade enablement, et cetera, et cetera, um, across that fourth area. So in terms of the first focus area, um, business models, the UN guiding principles are very clear that, the, that businesses should be addressing risks to people that are very core to their business, right? It's not a fringe due diligence activity. It's central to embedding into the DNA of organizations. And the reason that the guiding principles and the reason why we're pulling this out as a focus area is because business models are very determinant of incentives, of mental models that exist in businesses, on core business decisions that actually then set in, set in motion a whole series of events, processes, systems, decisions, approaches that often can be hard to mitigate at an operational level, right? So a business model logic will actually drive potential human rights risks, and we want to shine a light on the fact that due diligence should be applied to business models more widely. And we have in the scoping paper set out two or three sort of examples there of the types of business models that may, we may be looking at in the industry. Um, I want to be clear as well that this um, focus area is not about labeling a business model as bad or good. The guiding principles very much take the approach that we have to embed due diligence into understanding the impacts of business models, right? So what does, and the conclusion of the recent Amnesty International report um, around Facebook and Google kind of made that point, right, as one of the first recommendations. As a first step, human rights due diligence must be applied to the business models of these companies and indeed wider companies. And we also believe it's an important thing to engage diverse stakeholders on because we have to be careful, I think, not to um, drive uh, almost a pure kind of ideological reaction around a business model and to be very pragmatic around what the risks are. In part because individuals clearly depend on existing business models, right? So it's broadly acknowledged that the fact that people can access the internet or access a service like in a product like Facebook does enable civil society and other actors to uh, fulfill their rights and so we have to be honest and address some of the dynamics there and that's what we hope the project will do as well. In the scoping paper we've set out some of the questions we'll explore here. Um, so we're talk we're, the questions we ask are to what extent are the business models underlying technological development and the way they get sold generating human rights risks? What are some of the common examples of this? 
What should human rights due diligence in relation to business models and competitive strategies look like? What are the implications of thinking about what good practice look like when business models are designed around technical innovation, not vice versa? So recognizing sometimes that we don't have a business model looking for a technology, but a technology looking for a business model, which is pretty unique to this context. And also, how do we navigate situations where certain populations might gain from the current business model and actually gain in human rights terms from the current business model and may uh, be at risk if we dramatically change those? So that's the first focus areas that we will focus on. The second focus area is looking at human rights due diligence in end use. Again, the our guiding principles give a very clear steer around this in that companies have a responsibility to prevent, uh, mitigate and remediate issues that occur not just in their own operations but across their value chain. Um, that includes in relation to products and services, whether it's in the the way those products and services are designed and then used or the way in which those products and services might be misused intentionally or otherwise by third parties. So the guiding principles have a very broad remit of what responsibility looks like for a company and it includes those issues which clearly aren't always in the control of an individual company and also sometimes are not proximate to the individual company and in the context of technology might involve thousands, millions, billions of individuals making use of something that can be very hard to understand. What's critically important as well is that the guiding principles offer uh, a very simple concept, which is a concept of leverage to say that businesses need to lean into these challenges that are systemic in their kind of wider ecosystem. And so what we're interested in the project is well, what does that look like? Right? <laughs> what does due diligence look like in relation to end use? Um, what does it look like in terms of what does leverage look like? How is it successful? Um, what are some of the practical examples? And to Peggy's point, what are some of the dilemmas that companies come across when they're trying to use leverage, where sometimes there may not be visibility of who's even using the product? Um, or there might be uh, a state that is the actor that's using the product, and the way the contracts get set up are such that there is very little leverage naturally in those relationships. And so we're really trying to hone in on what are those key challenges. And this is a theme across the project. We will not provide all-encompassing methodological guidance around these issues. What we're going to focus in on is what are the kind of sharp end questions? What are the really difficult things where we believe clarity of normative expectation, examples of dilemmas and good practice, and also some tools and recommendations are very useful. So in this context, for example, we will start by looking at what actually already exists within the tech sector and beyond where we can draw lessons. What are the existing governance systems, approaches, um, methodologies that are being used? Where have we actually found good examples or where can we see good examples of companies really trying to address end use risks? Um, there are particular nuances in the guiding principles that I think do present challenges <laughs> for the industry and so we'll look at those. There's a, there's a key aspect in the guiding principles around companies needing to stop contribution to a third party misusing their product or to a harm being associated with their product and services. That can be particularly challenging when you're engaging in a situation where there's a web of other actors that might be contributing to this misuse or the harm. And sometimes the way you contribute to someone's behavior can be very subtle, right? It can be very uh, embedded in the design and it can, it can kind of develop over a period of time. Last week, we were in a meeting hosted by the Danish Institute for Human Rights and Business around human rights impact assessments in this space. And somebody said, you know, sometimes if you're contributing to a general um, environment of speech, that isn't a direct harm on people, but it can lead to direct harms on individuals. So we need to, be, we need to explore those questions. Um, we'll also look at questions about how you engage affected stakeholders in human rights due diligence and end use, um, what it, what, uh, how we deal with the question of scale and lack of visibility. Um, and really, uh, again, pinpoint some of these issues which we'll be mapping out publicly very shortly. Just to be clear, like I said, we're not going to map out methodology. Um, actually, the meeting we were at last week, the Danish Institute has a project where they're trying, where they will be developing a methodology for looking at taking the human rights impact assessment methodology and applying it in the context of technology. That's not what we will do, though we're working very closely with the Danish Institute. We will pick these kind of interesting approaches um, and interesting case studies. I'll also say that I think it's fair to say that the tendency of our work is going to be around organizational governance processes and systems around these issues, not per se uh, trying to innovate ourselves around technological solutions to these, right? 
there's partnership on AI, other organizations are doing great work to think about what might be some technological fixes in terms of data sheets for data sets, in terms of transparency there, algorithmic accountability. We're not going to ignore those issues, but I think it's fair to say that the thing we'll layer onto those issues is what does it mean for organizational governance? Uh, what does it mean for systems processes? What does it mean for accountability and their relationships with external stakeholders? Part of that is because we believe that the pace of change of technology needs to exist in a, co a governance context that creates a level of um, oversight and engagement around those questions, right, within an organization and more widely. The third area, and then I'm gonna, we are, I'll be, be quicker in the, the third and fourth area, is access to remedy, is the third area. Um, the UN guiding principles are very clear that when things go wrong, and things do clearly go wrong um, in quite horrible ways often, um, that when things go wrong, victims need to have access to remedy, right? That's a, an obvious statement in the context of this room um, and a human rights conference. Um, and the OHCHR has an existing project called the Accountability and Remedy Project, uh, which we will be building on um, within the context of this work. And I think we're looking at really where, where our early thinking has taken to us is to think about what is the remedy ecosystem that needs to exist around technology. In the context of technology, we are going to certainly think about, but probably not drive too deeply into the notion of kind of operational level grievance mechanisms, because it feels like it's not where the value add is in the context of the technology industry and technology sector. Though I do think there are lessons to be learned around how real time uh, technology companies can begin to understand where there are concerns or grievances um, that are being raised. Um, I think there are again distinct challenges that we'll focus in on here. One will be around um, the fact that there are multiple actors, as I've already said, that might be involved in a harm occurring. And so how do you unpack that? Another issue that's been mentioned to us before is just the sheer scale. When there are multiple things that might be going wrong that can be going wrong at different layers, how do you figure out where to prioritize, where you focus, who are the most vulnerable victims, who are the people that are suffering the most severe harms, and how do we prioritize those in a remedy context? But also the fact that the way the guiding principles map out remedy and the way we think about remedies has a huge reliance on states. So in a context where the state might be the, the actor that is uh, underpinning and even causing the harm, how do we square the circle of that reliance on looking to that same actor for providing an ecosystem of judicial and non-judicial systems uh, to provide remedy? Um, last piece, and then I'm gonna pause and allow you all to offer your kind of thoughts and comments and ideas, is the state duty to protect. So focus at area number four, um, it's clearly the first pillar in the UN guiding principles. And here we will do a few things. You know, clearly uh, we want to reinforce and make sure we keep pointing to existing state obligations around human rights um, and point to other parts of the UN system that are working on this issue and other special, and rep special rapporteurs that are doing so. But also to really get into the multiple levels at a kind of operational level for states as to what that really means around public procurement around um, trade facilitation, around regulation, around corporate governance requirements, a number of things, there's so many levers that states have, and we'll be exploring what are the ways in which states should use and could use those levers to create a governance framework for responsible technology that incentivizes and rewards technology companies and others that are being responsible, but clearly also is punitive or disincentivizes actors that are not being responsible. Again, we will uh, be sharing soon um, some of our initial direction of travel in, in this area. Some of the areas I think that are particularly ripe for exploration are one I've mentioned before, which is sort of public procurement and responsible contracting. We know very much that states are using different state agencies all the way from law enforcement to even um, you know, uh, kind of social benefit schemes. Um, different agencies within government are using these technologies. So what does it mean to be a responsible procurer <laughs> of these technologies and user? And what does responsible contracting look like between a state and a private company when um, agreements are made to provide services? And there's a lot of experience from the business and human rights field there we can draw on. The other area I think we need to pay attention to, and I don't know how we do this, is around policy coherence within states, right? So clearly there is a huge motivation to incentivize, to build, to, to benefit from innovation, economic growth. 
we have to make sure we don't end up with a kind of double speak around how states deal with, the, deal with this. So on the one hand, they try and incentivize economic growth, innovation solutions in terms of attracting technology innovation. On the other hand, perhaps um, we, need to make sure, so we need to make sure that doesn't get divorced from commitments to uh, meet human rights obligations in the context of states as well. So that's a particular challenge for this industry, but also more widely. Um, I'm going to pause there, and um, we will, and just, there's a lot there that I've thrown out on the table, but wanted to at least give you an overview, and just to open up for comments, questions, concerns about the project, points of clarification um, about particular focus areas or the direction of travel. Um, probably just a comment. So my name is Angela Kastner from the Digital Impact Alliance at UN Foundation. Uh, and I look specifically, I have a procurement background and look specifically at procurement in this area. <laughs> and my, my comment would be, I think it's uh, very, very pleased to see that you've mentioned this and it is a key lever for any government in how they, um, you know, achieve, achieve the SDGs, achieve good public service, but also in their supply chains are looking at how human rights are, are uh, you know, uh, that they understand what's happening in these supply chains. Uh, I guess one of the things we're, we're finding in this space, and from my own background, is th these are actually difficult things to procure and buy. We don't have always the educated buyers, and that's not just in developing countries. I mean, the US, the UK, other, you know, governments don't always get this right. So, so there's also, I think, a capacity gap, and I mean, I'm sure there's, there's issues you've, you've looked at, but it's just very pleasing, I think, to see that that's also one of the key levers that you'll include. I'm so glad you're here, because we've been looking for <laughs> the right people that are also thinking about this a bit more already, so great. Come back to you. Well, we <laughs> Other comments on this? Okay, so I'm gonna to go to this side of the room, um, and then I've got another individual here, and I, so I've got three people. Okay, good, let's. Hi, thanks. Um, my name is Mary Jean, and I'm here as part of the Open Internet um, for Democracy Leaders program. Um, my comment slash question is, um, within the field of um, international human rights as a field on its own, it has very um, difficult challenges, particularly when it comes to um, attributing what what is considered a human rights violation as it is, um, particularly given the geopolitical alignment with various countries camping in opposing fields on what's considered a human rights violation. So now my question is, when it comes to business uh, models and a commercially driven agenda, um, that has obviously much higher stakes. And so now when incorporating a human rights lens and a guiding principle in that view, when already within human rights as it is on its own as a particular field on its own has its own fair share of challenges, how are you going to then you know, align and harmonize this very dichotomous different fields um, in, in business models and particularly accountability? Is it going to be like a red lining um, of um, a kind of situation there in terms of attributing, you know, especially if it's state actors, um, what is considered a human rights violation? Thanks. Thank you. Let's go to sure. the other two questions. Hi, my name is Morgan Frost from the Center for International Private Enterprises, SIPE. We're really pleased to see um, this new initiative. Just one quick question in terms of incentivizing businesses to sign on to these types of principles. Are you specifically looking into the business case for digital rights, uh, making sure that um, there is incentive for businesses to sign on without jeopardizing um, economic growth? Thank you. Thank you. I, two more there, Dan. So an individual. No. Yes. Wonderful. Um, there, gentlemen. Please come to the table and find a microphone. Uh, my name is uh, uh, Karl Steinacker from um, International um, Civil Society Center here in Berlin. My question is a bit similar to that one. You know, the, the human rights founding documents as we know them, they are from an analog world. And uh, the, the question is when you uh, um, do your research or you propose uh, due diligence, is there any concept you're applying of digital rights? Um, or 
how, how, how do you uh, uh, apply this uh, uh, traditional human rights concept to these new technologies? Thank you. Great questions. Um, anyone else before we try and respond? Oh, please, yes. Yeah, thank you. Rauno Merisari, Human Rights Ambassador at the Ministry for Foreign Affairs of Finland. Uh, my question is also about the due diligence. Um, many countries, including Finland, we are discussing the new laws or amendments to the legislation on, on due diligence. Um, I just wonder whether you have been able to somewhere to look at this, this side, some way making compression to the, this self-regulation, pros and cons, uh, possible uh, findings and, and uh, uh, recommendations. Thank you. Great. Oh, and one more. I just have a short question. Um, I'm Lisa, uh, a senior program manager at Ranking Digital Rights. And my, my question is actually, are you aware of the project uh, uh, ranks internet and telecommunications companies on privacy and freedom of expression uh, using the UN principles? Um, so yeah, I would just be interested to hear. Thank you. Um, so I can, I'm gonna answer the last two questions first and then we'll I'll answer, I'll make some comment on the other questions and then, but Peggy's also going to weigh in as well. Um, so ranking digital rights, are we, yes, we, we are very aware <laughs> of your work um, and have engaged, Rebecca was with us in Tunis um, and your colleague was with us last week in Copenhagen. <laughs> um, so very aware of, of the work and clearly um, look forward to, we know also that you've been, particularly our, our focus area one, have been paying a little more attention in your new rankings to business models as well. So we're very keen to learn about what you find in that process here. Um, around mandatory human rights due diligence and the movements around that, um, I think that it, so I have a few, I don't have an answer to how we'll deal with it in the project, but, but I have some reflections, um, I think. One is that we'll need to look at whether as states um, require due diligence and the way they structure that and the, the, the guidance they give to companies, whether there is a case for uh, some alertness to the uniqueness of different industries, right? And I think that clearly is. And so I think we hope that this project would be able to feed into any uh, uh, awareness within governments around how, what mandatory due diligence should be, what it looks like in this context and what some of the particularities might be. Um, I also think that mandatory due diligence, we definitely want to see it clearly, and this is a general business and human rights comment, right? We want to see it in the context of other levers that states have. And so clearly it's one critical lever, but obviously, as we've said before, kind of public procurement and trade. And I, so I, I think as we get to our fourth sort of smart mix focus area, um, we'll definitely think about due diligence in this con mandatory due diligence, but need to, we need to, in this project, figure out where the value add is, right? And it might be in some of those other levers, given there is such a movement around the due diligence piece. To be decided, um, but we definitely can't ignore that pretty interesting kind of movement and development. Um, I want to then, so the digital rights piece, I think we need to, I don't think we can be fundamentalist <laughs> about kind of what, what, what it, about how we have defined, right? Um, so I think we can be fundamentalist in terms of we know where the baseline is, <laughs> right? Um, but I don't think we can be fundamentalist in terms of thinking about what are those particular salient issues for this industry, right? And how are they manifest itself and how are we even reconceptualizing concepts of rights as well? And, so this is again an area where my expertise you know, falls off a cliff. <laughs> and so we need to be thinking about that clearly when we talk about the normative framework within which this sits. Um, in terms of incentivizing, um, I think it's a really interesting question. I think I see that in two parts. On the one hand, we want to keep pushing forward the notion and the reality that the guiding principles set a normative expectation. This isn't a choice. These aren't principles you sign up to. Right, this is clearly embedded, this is the norm, this is being, um, as the gentleman's mentioned, embedded in national law around the world increasingly. Um, 
different civil society actors are demanding that companies meet their responsibility to respect human rights. So I think we want to shy away from saying that we need to make a business case for not harming people in this way. At the same time, I think we do have to be clear that there are, and talk about and identify in empirical terms, where the value comes from doing the right thing, right? And that's, I think, an interesting conversation we'll have with some of the investor community. Um, we are very keen next year as one of our convenings to engage with the Investor Alliance for Human Rights, who have embedded, who have said a lot about technology, um, actually, and in, input it into this project. Also, I think the challenging dynamic of VCs in this space and the speed at which innovation is demanded. Historically, we have found that doesn't bode well for thinking about risks to people. So I think there's an interesting dynamic there that we have around the way the market incentivizes certain business models and approaches. Um, I think I'm going to hand over to you now. Um, thanks. And, and just to chime in on, on a couple of the points made, I, on the, the business case point, I, I think it's a really interesting issue, and we brought it back in an earlier session as well, that this issue of, it's one thing to say, no, we don't, you know, we should, as, as Mark said, think that the guiding principles are, are you know, optional in that sense. Um, but at the same time, you know, we do work in an environment, and your last comment about uh, venture capital also shows where, in fact, we work in a world where not only are we not incentivizing companies to do the right thing, there sometimes are strong incentives for them to do the wrong thing. Um, and I, you know, I do think that we need to take that on um, as part of the conversation as well. And you know, fortunately, that fourth focus area, I think, will also allow us to talk about how governments can do better in that regard. Um, and I think it goes, I, I take your point, I mean, this, is, this isn't easy. Um, and I don't think we want to say that you know, through any one project or any one lens, we're going to be able to you know, solve these issues in a way that's, that's necessarily going to work for everyone. Um, but I think part of what brought us to it is that idea of what, where we have value added. You started out by saying, talking about attributing human rights violations. I think that's something our office does very well. Um, and, you know, we obviously sometimes get feedback from governments that disagree with what we said. But, you know, we issue hundreds of reports a year and most of it because we're sort of a central player that has developed methodologies that are seen as credible and reliable. We have the ability to do that and it has an impact. And we're hoping that, you know, this is an extension of that, that we will, you know, be solid in terms of the methodology and I think the, the approach that we've already shown in terms of the public consultations around the scoping paper and the way that we're engaging will also allow um, us to, to develop something that I think could both push the conversation forward and have the level of credibility and cross um, stakeholder uh, reliability that, that people will look for. Um, the other thing I'd say though, and I, I, I should stress this because I stress it with, with Mark and Lenny and with the team frequently, is there is a challenge as a UN actor to engage in this space because there's a, you know, the ways in which we have tended to work are not at the metabolism rate engagement that sometimes is necessary for us to be responsive to what the need is in the digital space. And, and I think everyone feels like, not just our organization, but we're all kind of behind the curve on this. There's so much that's already being done and you know, we're having this conversation now and we want to start moving as quickly as possible to having the guidance and, and the ideas and the practical case studies that will have an immediate impact. So in terms of the methodology we're taking here, um, I think we are going to try to be innovative and that may mean that sometimes we might make uh, steps in, in directions that, that could open us up uh, for more criticism than other times. But I, I think it's worth taking some of those risks in, in this project and we are going to sort of push to move it forward, but it means that we'll need to come back to stakeholders like yourselves to, to find out how we're doing along the way and adapt uh, the approaches that we're taking as, as we go forward. Um, the other thing I wanted to just comment on briefly is the, the comments about digital rights and how they fit in. Um, you know, it's a fundamental premise of how we work that, you know, human rights are digital rights. They, human rights operate offline and online. And the, the statements and principles that have been developed within digital rights frameworks 
are all embedded in the human rights framework as well. So I don't see any, any tension there. Um, the real question is sometimes, um, is the human rights framework up to date enough? And I think your comment uh, applied that as well by talking about it being analog. I don't think concepts like human dignity and, and uh, the need for privacy, the need for non-discrimination are, are analog ideas, you know? Um, and I think that what we need to figure out is how we make them useful in a new environment. And that's exactly what this project is, is geared at, the recognition that how we, how we work on discrimination, how we work on privacy, how we work on freedom of expression in the digital space does require us to look at things differently and to dive more deeply on some of these issues, which is what we're trying to do here. Thank you, Peggy. Um, so I'm going to um, uh, share a few more comments, but then just talk um, in the final minutes around what the beginning of next year looks like in concrete terms um, to give you a sense of that. But I wanted to just also build on two things Peggy said there around the sense of um, adequacy of existing frameworks for the challenges we face. From my perspective, you know, having worked in for 10 to 15 years with different businesses and different industry groups and others and civil society organizations around business challenges, some of the issues I hear about challenges of incentives, challenges of integration, challenges of getting folks in certain part of the business to move far, that want to move really fast with innovation and others want to slow it down to create the right incentive structure around industry are, are challenges we have certainly got some learning to bring to, right? If you think about the way business functions in society, we've got some experience from the past you know, decades around that. They're not exactly the same industries and those industries are always unique. But I do think there's a lot there also around the sort of the way the business and human rights field has build frameworks, approaches, tools, knowledge, um, the way businesses in, have, have also kind of found solutions around this that we can also learn from that I don't think are outmoded in any shape or form given the dynamics we're talking about. Um, and the second thing I wanted to say was process-wise, we will, you know, what we're trying to do in the process is that the process itself has space to talk about dilemmas and address dilemmas very clearly. And so that is a challenge for us because we can't deal with all the dilemmas, so we're going to have to figure out how we respond to that. But it's not uncommon for other processes in the UN to hear and talk about specific cases that come up, right? And we're going to have to be selective and think about our mandate versus mandates of other rapporteurs. But we definitely want to build that into the system. So very quickly, um, in the last few minutes, um, what does the first half of next year look like? Um, and indeed, where do we want to be by the end of next year? We will be shortly um, publishing some foundational papers around focus area two and focus area four, um, so human rights due diligence and end use and the smart mix of measures. Um, we will be doing a bit more research on areas one and three, so business models and indeed on access to remedy. We will be kicking off, we're just trying to formalize relationships with partners to do um, some deep dive research into the business model questions and we'll be working with some academic partners on that, both to map various examples of where business models might pose human rights risks, but also to offer some typology of the ways we think about this challenge and to point to what human rights issues in practice might mean in this context as well. So that will be happening, followed by some multi-stakeholder and expert convenings in the first quarter of next year. We hope to have a Silicon Valley convening in the first quarter, I don't know when we're going to do that, to bring together really around, I think, that second focus area primarily around human rights due diligence and end use, to look at good practices, to understand, to bring some dilemmas to the table, but also to get a bit deeper into those sharp end questions that I mentioned earlier as well. And we'll also be having a consultation somewhere in Asia, I believe, though to be decided exactly where, um, that will kind of repeat some of those conversations as well to bring that perspective in. Through the midway through next year, I think we'll begin to ramp up a bit more on our remedy work and the sort of smart mix of measures work. And that will realistically kind of kick in, partly because I think we want to get a foundation in those aspects that really are so operationally pertinent and urgent for the business community here. Um, and as I said, we'll also be publishing a small piece of uh, research around conflict as well and international humanitarian law um, and technology and conflict situations, um, I think by April, May time. Really, where do you want to be? So I've got three seconds, and I'm not going to do it in three seconds, but I'll do it in maybe 15 seconds. Um, by the end of next year, we 
really want to have fleshed out around these four focus areas, what are the big challenging issues? What are the key two or three things that we can add value on and have built a level of multi-stakeholder discussion and consensus around the nature of those problems? We also want to have pointed to paths forward for dealing with those <laughs> solutions in a practical way. And we also want to have on the table some proposed deliverables for this project, right? So to be able to say, okay, now that we've understood the problem, now that we've started talking about solutions, what can this project really deliver in terms of guidance, case studies, tools, methodologies, frameworks, recommendations across these different focus areas that we can deliver on that will be things that will can then be used moving forward for the wider field. So that's kind of our journey. That doesn't mean to say we're not delivering things next year, but it does mean to say that we're gonna be delivering things sort of iteratively as we go. It didn't take 15 seconds, took a minute, but Peggy, over to you for closing okay. thoughts. Great, no, and I um, appreciate everybody being here and uh, indicating interest in this by, by your presence. Um, ultimately, this will succeed or fail based on the, the level of engagement and support that we get from people like those in the room. So to just really a plea uh, to all of you to, to continue to follow this project, you know, go to the website that I mentioned and, and look at the materials there, join us in these consultations, give us your feedback and thoughts. Uh, for those of you who are able, uh, we, of course, as the, the smallest uh, percentage, despite being a pillar of the UN, we're always looking for additional support. Uh, we have a somewhat unique funding model for this project in that we're, we are obviously very open to government support, as, as that is, of course, where most of the funding for the office comes from. And Switzerland has already come in and, and been very generous in that regard, and we appreciate additional support. But we also, because this is a project that will require active, not just you know, the, the visceral type of, oh yeah, we support it, uh, engagement from companies, but actually a seat at the table that will allow us to address the problems that they see and uh, get their buy-in to really take up the deliverables and the things that come out of it. Um, we're uh, funding as well through a consortium model where we're asking for a small investment from companies that are interested in the project. Um, we do that purposely to avoid the, the due diligence issues on our side. Um, in other words, we wouldn't have a project that would be fully funded uh, from the corporate sector for this, but we do want that sort of stake in the game from those that are, are gonna participate in it. So we're looking for companies who wanna join us um, in the work and a, a sort of nominal contribution to show that they're, they're truly committed and will follow through on what comes out of the work as well. So um, happy to have any and all of you uh, come back to us on, on any of those points. And again, just thank you for your time today.